Hi, everyone. Hi. I'm Sarah Stewart Craker. I am an assistant professor of ethics uh, in the Faculty of Theology at the University of Geneva, and I'm delighted to be um, presiding over this panel on David Neuheiser's recently published book, Hope in a Secular Age, Deconstruction, Negative Theology, and the Future of Faith. Um, and I think it's, it's a really it's a perfectly apt book to be talking about in these uncertain times. Um, this event was originally scheduled, speaking of um, certainty, for the European Academy of Religion annual meeting, um, which was to take place in June in Bologna. And um, as it happens, we are holding it now here online, as so many events um, <laughs> are now these days. And it's sponsored, so it's sponsored by um, the European Academy of Religion, as well as by the Institute for Religion and Critical Inquiry at Australia Catholic University, which is where David is a research fellow. So I'll just mention a couple of practical matters before very briefly introducing our panelists and getting started. Um, so if you, what the way that we'll proceed is we'll have about five minutes um, from each of the panelists responding to David's book. Um, then David will respond and then we'll open it up for discussion, um, which can happen among the panelists, um, but we'll also take questions um, from participants. So if you would like to ask a question, um, please send it to me in a direct private message using the conversation function. Um, and I will be taking note of those. If you have a question while people are talking, feel free to send it, um, send it along when it occurs to you. I will be, um, and then I will um, select questions for, to introduce into the discussion um, when we turn to that. Um, and so we have four panelists today um, and I will just briefly introduce them in the order in which they will speak. So first we'll have John Milbank, Emeritus Professor of Theology and Religious Studies at the University of Nottingham. Marius Njaland, um, is Professor of Philosophy of Religion at the University of Oslo. Michelle Sanchez, who's Associate Professor of Theology at Harvard Divinity School. And Andre Willis, who is Associate Professor of Religious Studies at Brown University. So we're an international crowd today. And um, I'm so glad to see so many people have, um, have logged on. We are recording um, this panel and the discussion. So just to let you know that that is happening and this way we'll be able to make it available to um, those who are not able to participate live um, at a later time. And I think that's everything for in the way of introductory remarks. Um, so let's get started. I'll pass, um, I'll pass it off now then to John Milbank who will kick us off. Thank you. Um, thanks very much indeed. Um, well uh, I, I enjoyed reading your, your, your book David and um, I, I, I agreed with some of it uh, uh, and uh, not with other bits of it, as you can probably um, imagine. Um, it, it, it was, uh, for me, it, it was a little bit nostalgic, I suppose, in a sense, in that I think we had all these debates about Derrida and negative theology um, quite a while ago. Uh, and to some extent, people seem to have moved on to other territories since then. But I, I think you successfully updated it by um, relating it to questions of political theology and ethics, um, and especially to some of the concerns of um, uh, Giorgio Agamben, uh, and your your focus on um, the ethical seemed to be um, perhaps the most novel thrust in what you were saying. So, slightly taking us away from these concerns about epistemology. Um, uh, and certainty and, and uh, the indeterminacy of language and so on um, 
towards um, the grounds of the ethical, which of course people have seen as more and more to the fore in the later um, Derrida, um, but which you, I, I think quite rightly argue, was always actually um, pretty important um, for him. Um, I suppose, uh, you know, where I would agree with you is, is in, in, broadly speaking, in your account of apophasis, that in the case of uh, Dionysus the Areopagite, as I'm sure Dennis Turner, uh, um, another Dennis, will, 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 um, will, will agree, um, it, you know, that he is trying to go beyond both positivity and negation, and, and ultimately, it's a negation also of the negation. It's, it's, a, it's a question of apophasis. It's a question of a transcendence altogether of our capacities of um, uh, language and conceptuality. Um, I think that's right. And that certainly um, assists the idea that this isn't just a sort of exercise in mystical skepticism, um, but is trying to... Uh, bring us experientially towards an absolute um, that, that we, uh, uh, that impinges on us, that put, if you like puts pressure on us, puts pressure on us ethically um, and also as you want to say um, um, politically. So I agree about all that. Um, I, I think you know the major difficulty as you yourself are, uh, realized is how do we put together two figures who are so historically disparate and who emerge from such totally different um, contexts that, um, as you say, uh, um, in the case uh, we've got a, a religious and a mystic um, living in the very, very early Middle Ages or the late antique period, however you want to see it. And then on the other hand, we've got Derrida, a modern philosopher working um, in the wake of Kant and so on. And I suppose in the end that I'm not convinced that you're managing to mediate that gap or, or that you're not still kind of underestimating it. Um, and I think that especially applies to the points where you're trying to see Dionysus's negative enterprise as something like, you know, a modern critical one, whether we're talking philosophically or politically, this seems to import into him perhaps a rather anachronistic language. So, I mean, obviously you're well aware and you give a good discussion of people trying to say, well, actually the, the negativity, the apophaticism in Dionysus is qualified by his talk about church hierarchies and so on. But, I think you you much too much assume that um, that's the qualification of the negativity. Whereas uh, on my reading of Dionysus, and I would think for people like Andrew Love as well, in fact, they, the hierarchies, which are you know angelic hierarchies as well as um, uh, as well as church hierarchies, are themselves the processes of mediation of the positive and and, and the negative. And, and I, I think you, for me, underestimate the, the degree to which the whole set of assumptions here are metaphysical and neoplatonic. That he, he's, um, and probably I would say this rather more than Dennis Turner, that he's just not operating in a modern epistemological space at all. Um, so that primarily for him, negative and positive are, uh, are metaphysical, they're ontological. It, God is literally negation, he's outside all boundaries and so on. He's even he, he's even outside knowledge because that's too much about boundaries. Where the positive is are the positive things that God has created. And when when we name things, we're naming the things in creation, including the angels and so on. So the, the question of of how the positive, the negative relate in in Dionysus is um, very much a metaphysical um, question. And I think that. You're, you're not sufficiently engaging with the fact that, you know, compared to Derrida, um, Dionysus is in a Neoplatonic trajectory. He, he thinks that the absolute is one, and he thinks that the absolute is the good. And, and it's the one and the good and, um, and peace um, 
for, um, which for him mediates the positive and the negative. There are several passages where he makes it completely clear that it, in fact it's the good that crosses this boundary between creation and uh, and creator and between the positive uh, uh, and the negative. The good as the ecstatic goes out from the completely indeterminate into um, the determinate. So in, in that sense, you've got a metaphysics around unity and a metaphysics of participation in goodness that clearly Derrida refuses <laughs> because he, he's not positing anything like um, uh, an, an absolute in that sense. He's operating it's in a, in a post-Kantian space, or, albeit he's sort of turning that into a linguistic framework, but it's a linguistic framework um, that only ever issues in, 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 in a skeptical, in a skeptical gesture. And so what what lies beyond that is certainly not unity is certainly not the good it's something much more like a kind of completely sublime abyss about which we really can say nothing so that he ultimately he's still a transcendentalist thinker and, and i have to say here as a footnote that it's notable that most continental philosophy has now moved into a very different um, sphere that uh, you know the questioning of Kant now and the movement back into metaphysics away from even the post-structuralist version of transcendentalism is you know with Badiou and the followers of Deleuze um, and then with Meersu and so on is very very marked um, you know and I, I would like to see theology now much more engaging with this kind of return to metaphysics um, and then we could read somebody like Dionysus, you know, in a way much more honestly as as a metaphysical thinker. Now, you know, what does all this mean in sort of ethical and practical and political terms? Well, I think the most important point is that um, for, for Dionysus, there, there, there can be some kind of analogical um, expression of of the transcendent the, and and so that ethically and politically we can have some sense that some definite project although it's not perfect is as it were on the way towards getting somewhere so it's it's not a matter for him of simply you know translated into the ethical and political it's not a matter of simply endless negative critique um you know which would be endlessly setting up something to pull it down again um, endlessly saying something is inadequate, it's not perfect freedom as yet, which really only delivers you the kind of politics that can support um, a sort of uh, uh, a sort of liberal formalism. And ultimately, I would see Derrida as actually a rather conventional liberal social democrat, and unable to push beyond that precisely because of this kind of transcendentalist framework. Um, where, whereby he can only make negative gestures. Whereas I think that the, the, you know, the tradition that Dionysus represents, there is some possibility um, of, 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 of putting, uh, putting forward, um, you, you know, a project that is at least, as it were, on the way there. And, and, and it's, it's, it's here that I would fit in what he has to say about the church and about revelation. You know, he makes it incredibly clear that only, in fact, you know, the language of the Bible provides you with the names of God. So that uh, he doesn't have any separation between rational and revealed um, philosophy. He's much more saying something like um, the combination of the positive and the negative. The, 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 the sort of the perception of the good, as it were, breaking through is always a matter of revelation. Um, and he actually says at one point that an angel has revealed this truth to every nation, but only the Hebrews listened, which is very, very, very significant. So in, in a way, he has a wide sense of what revelation means. But he also believes that sort of one tradition, if you like, ha, ha, has attended. So for him, um, you know, 
the Bible, liturgical enactment, the life of the church is, if you like, this concrete attempt to, um, you, you know, to express the mystery and sort of built into that are all sorts of reserves about the inadequacy of doing that. But nonetheless, the sense of a liturgical performance and trying to sort of live this new life of charity and the good in, in the church and, uh, and, you know, approximations to that in terms of the monastic life and that sort of thing, these positive political projects. So, you know, the final thing that I would say is to me that contrasts strongly with, you know, Agamben's recommendation of an inoperativity which seems to be like a form of contemplation so extreme that the only way in which we stay being human is to sort of exit the whole cultural project altogether i mean it's a weird combination of benjamin and heidegger and it seems to me to be an incredibly despairing kind of gesture almost you know despairing of our whole human existence in excess of animality and trying to reduce it merely to a sort of awareness that other animals don't have of our existential situation. Again, this is the, the very sort of Heideggerian uh, element. And I would see a gamut as like Derrida is now a very conservative figure compared to the sort of the, you know, the, the return to speculative realism uh, and, and, and so on, which I, I would much prefer theology to be um, to be engaging with. So I, I don't yeah, feel that good. what you're saying is related yeah. enough to sort of concrete political suggestion and concrete political things that alone can give us hope in the era of Trump and Johnson and all these dreadful people, you know? That's Wonderful. all. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, thank you so much. Um, and so we will shift now to Marius Mjolland, um, joining us from Oslo. Hello, everyone. Um, <clears throat> thanks for a uh, very interesting comments, uh, and John. And, and uh, I think I disagree on the Gamban, but we'll come back to that. <laughs> okay. Um, very delighted to be here and to uh, and also to read this this beautiful uh, book with the cover uh, on uh, hope in a secular age. Um, I just wanted to restrict my uh, first comments here to two points, um, and the first point is perhaps not very surprisingly on negative theology uh, because I, uh, I I simply enjoyed reading. Uh, uh, your reading of Dionysus, David, uh, and um, at the point where you, where, you, where you arrive at the critique of both Caputo and Marion uh, in their respective readings uh, of Dionysus, uh, on the one hand, you reject the, uh, the atheism of Caputo and the confession, confessional affirmation of uh, Marion. And you argue that they both say somehow too much about this old text. They see an affirmation of their own position. Uh, and the one says it's a kind of atheist piety and the other is Catholic conform conformity. Uh, and the point of Neuheiser here, this is a radical negation. It's, it's non-speaking, it's silence. Uh, and that's, I would even say, perhaps the most beautiful point in, in, in this text. Um, and even a negation of your own position as as reader, um, and I think this is uh, the the tension which you very productively use in order to read our times somehow. Uh, so 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 you you take it out of that context and apply it in the in the contemporary uh, situation. Um, and I could even say that I agree with this reading. <laughs> I think it's a good reading of Dionysus. Uh, um, and I could even say that I affirm your emphasis on negation. <laughs> and still, I, I do disagree. <laughs> and uh, I protest and negate uh, your effort at 
construing a new sense in Dionysius. Uh, because I think this uh, book on mystical theology or the whole corpus of Dionysius, I think it's, it's not about hope. Um, and you, you have you discussed this, whether this is actually there in the text, uh, and you say, well, well, there are some passages where you could say there's a kind of temporalization of this text and of the problem, um, but still there is no one else who's seen it uh, in these texts. <laughs> uh, and I wasn't quite convinced that this is what is at stake for Dionysius. Um, I can't see any genuine or radical temporalization of ontology or of the problems discussed, um, and not really an apocalypticism or messianism, which you could find in other uh, authors, at least a bit earlier and a bit later than Dionysius. So um, is this an original reading of, of Dionysius? Yes, it is. Um, But I can't really find this hope nor the despair uh, in the Dionysian texts. My second point, I still have two minutes, I think, uh, is this question about hope, which you're raising, uh, which is really a big existential and political issue. And you also raise it as a kind of ethical uh, issue in your text. But why? Why then hope? And I wrote this uh, while I read the, 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 the introduction uh, to this book, Why Hope? As an effort at reading Dionysus and Derrida together. And I see there is so much going on in politics uh, with American election coming up, Trump, Brexit, China, whatever. Uh, but that's, I mean, that's context. That is a context which you describe also as a kind of secular uh, context for, for doing this. Um, and there is even a kind of personal confession in the introduction. I wrote this book because I believe it is hard to hope. And I agree. I think, I think you're right there. <laughs> uh, but is this the good, the best optic at finding a way of presenting hope as a political uh, theology? Um, I just refer to some of your definitions of hope here. It's a disciplined resilience. Hope unsettles the secular. Um, hope is the decision added to desire. And by doing that, it may transcend the imminent frame. And then you have this claim that deconstruction and negative theology share a hope that is identical in kind, though not in context. And if, when it comes to this final, final uh, point, I just, just ask, is that so? Is it identical uh, in kind, though not in con content? What would this alleged identity be? Is it political, ethical, existential? Is it about messianism, temporalization? I mean, there is a question of hope in Derrida. But, and it's a question of ascesis, ascesis, uh, ascetic. But I think it's desperate. And I see this desperation even here uh, at stake in your text, it's somehow a desperate hope. And maybe that's, that's the issue which you want to investigate. There's no way around this despair uh, in secular times. And that's why hope against hope is necessary. Uh, I would suggest a different way of treating hope here uh, because you return to this, this will, this discipline, this ethics of hope the whole time, 
but why not try to discuss hope at least hope in despair as a kind of gift and belonging to the discourse of a gift um, of course always relating to calculation and the problems belonging to that but breaking it up as a gift um, so that would be where I would continue after reading your book on uh, hope in the secular age. Thank you. Thank you so much, Maurice. Thank you, Maurice. And um, now we'll turn um, the audio over to Michelle Sanchez, joining us from Harvard. Hey, everybody. Uh, thanks so much to David for writing this book and for inviting me to be part of this great panel celebrating it. Um, so just to rehearse um, the argument, because I think that's always helpful to hear what somebody else thinks of your argument or what they take the, the argument to be. Um, I took there to be three main points that this book is contributing. One is that negative theology ought to be a crucial conversation partner with political theology, which I think is necessary and brilliant, and I completely agree. Another, and this is kind of unpacking the first one, is that negative political theology, you know, whatever that is, whatever we can sort of debate that being, entails an exercise of desacralizing politics rather than sacralizing politics, which enables us to move beyond the frustrating binary that so often emerges in the literature between political theology and its putative necessity and secular politics that doesn't want to claim, uh, especially, you know, liberal politics that doesn't want to claim to be taking part in political theology. Um, and then finally, that hope is the important, maybe the, the central, the crucial theological and political category to facilitate this work between negative theology and political theology. Um, so I found myself kind of moving in two different directions and trying to piece together how these two things fit. One, that negative theology ought to talk to political theology in the broadly, what we might call the Schmidtian tradition of political theology. Um, and second, that hope is, is the bridge category for this, which I found really interesting and compelling. And I, I think like other people have already said, it didn't seem apparent to me at the beginning that, that hope is this category. Um, but I found it interesting to think with because um, hope is not something that I find myself at least professionally thinking about a lot, although I'm sure like most people, it's a question with great personal day-to-day -day stakes. So what does hope have to do with the way that we live together, the way that we live individually? Um, so I, I thought it was really good to sort of lift this up at this time. I remember telling some students at some point a few years ago, which seems kind of dumb now, but a few years ago that, you know, of Kant's three questions, what can we know, what ought we to do, and for what may we hope, the hope part is not something that really seems relevant. And, and in fact, it's, you know, maybe one of the more suspect parts of Kant's writing, but that's a bit of an aside. Um, so with that introduction, I've got three basic questions, um, which were basically areas that um, I wanted to think with this book more and, and press it and think beyond it and, and hear from David and other people um, how you would respond to these three issues. Um, it's kind of taking the argument for granted of the book and then what, what, is, what does this mean in terms of praxis? So the first question, um, has to do with hope as a discipline, which the book reiterates over and over again, hope is a discipline. I find that completely enticing, um, but I wanted, I, I wanted more from what a discipline of hope actually looks like. Like what does it involve? What kind of community um, exercises this discipline? What kind of uh, rules, so to speak, like you know, in the sense of a Benedictine rule, does the discipline entail? Um, and what does that have to do with political institutions and, um, modes of political identity. So um, one, one story that came to mind um, immediately when I read this was not actually anything to do with, you know, the major figures thinking about hope historically, but actually a, a sermon that I heard, I, I guess I would say kind of right at the tail end of the first phase of the current COVID catastrophe. So at least in the United States, this was kind of end of May or beginning of May when everybody was realizing that this was bad. It wasn't going to end anytime soon. And people were learning how to process that. Uh, and I heard this sermon where the preacher recounted um, talking to a colleague of his and saying, you know, how are you doing? How are you managing? And she said, well, I'm actually doing a lot better since I've given up hope. 
And, you know, there was real relatability to that. When I heard this, I was like, yeah, that sounds about right. Uh, but then the preacher went on to quote or paraphrase a quote by Roberto Unger, who said, hope is best understood not as the cause of action, but as the consequence of action. And then his takeaway in the sermon was that we must continue doing the work of building relationships, of maintaining connections with each other, even though it's really hard. And then in doing so, we might just stumble upon hope in the process. We might find something like hope is kindled. Um, and I thought it was interesting, you know, because it, it reverses the, the order around which we usually think of hope. And I wondered if something like that was what was going on in this book. So, so that's the first question. What does the discipline look like? What are its practices? Um, and what does that have to do with communities? That leads to my second question, which is, um, has to do with the aesthetic and material dimensions of hope as a political virtue. Um, in my experience, secular critiques of political theology usually worry about two things in particular. And one is the unavoidable authoritarianism that is presumed to be tied to a relation to transcendence. So if, if politics is transcendent, then there's kind of an authoritarian core that you can't get past. And then the second one has to do with the aesthetic sublimity of religion as a register prone to fascism. So if negative theology is an important corrective to political theology, what might comprise a negative aesthetic? Um, and this is a question that I, I've actually been thinking about a lot after reading this book. I, I know the book doesn't go in that direction, but I was wondering if, you know, David, as having like spent so much time with this and written it, if you have thoughts about what a, a negative political aesthetic would look like um, in contrast to sort of the classic fascist aesthetic that, you know, has been written about, you know, with big mountains and collections of people moving in order. What does it look like to disrupt that? Um, and then the, the second dimension to this is what does the negative aesthetic have to do with bodies themselves? Um, and by body, I mean both the individual bodies governed by political institutions and governmentality, and I mean the political institutions that we imagine as a body politics, so like a collective body. Um, I've heard fascism described as the effort to give society a body, a particular kind of body that looks and acts a certain way. Um, but I could also echo Sylvia Winter's claim that the phenomenon of Western colonialism and white supremacy stems from an overrepresentation of man to the exclusion of a human other. Um, and if I kind of am thinking about all these different critiques of various dimensions of the modern West, there seems to be something really important in an aesthetic and body discipline of negation. So how do we tie the linguistically oriented Derrida and Dionysius to exercises of arts and the body, and especially those with a political dimension? Might we hope that by profaning existing patterns of political affirmation, we will inversely sacralize the bodies that are rendered profane or excluded or inglorious um, by the existing political operations of the institutions that we live under. Um, if I, I just wanna indicate where I would go with this real quick. Um, if I were to explore this, I would look in two possible directions and one returns to Derrida's writing and all of his um, elusive references to the Quora, which I have always read, and this, this goes back to some comments that were made earlier about like what lies beyond for Derrida. And he references this Cora in, in like really, you know, odd places, but then he always connects the Cora to some kind of materiality. And I always read that to sort of disrupt the idea that, that for Derrida, what is beyond is some just sheer sublime or some emptiness or something like that. But actually what is beyond is some sort of materiality that can speak back. And through this exercise of positivity and negation, there's some kind of a way to, to honor and recognize a form of materiality that disrupts the way materiality has been materialized previously. So there's, that to me seems to be a site ripe for thinking about a certain kind of hope. Um, and the second has to do with an author you referenced, Joseph Winters, and his book on hope, where he specifically looks to places of loss um, as an exercise of memory and sees that as, as part of the negation. Then, but again, it's not just an empty negation. The negation is looking at loss and the, the suffering and the melancholy caused by loss to think about hope. Okay, so that was my second question. I have one more. I'll try to be really quick. Um, so this one returns to more explicit theological territory and it has to do with not just the negation, but the affirmation. So a few people have already mentioned this, but um, the, and the book makes this clear, you know, it, like apophasis 101, there is no apophasis without cataphasis. It's not just negation, there is a positivity. 
So it matters then what is being said. And when you perform the negation, it, the negation will have a different impact depending on what the positive statement, what the cataphasis has been. So I wanted to think about this in a political register. Um, I think it impacts what a negative political theology would be. And it makes us ask, what are the normative sources of political cataphasis? So like, as uh, I think John was talking earlier about Dionysius, you know, taking all of the names of God from the Bible, what are the normative sources of a political formation um, that then undergoes a negation? Um, and how do we do that kind of work? So what is like the positive work that we have to do in this discipline of hope that's then accompanied by a posture of negation? And if I'm going to be specific, I'm thinking about the mood right now in the United States and elsewhere that favors a mode of negation, uh, the negation of institutions and bureaucrats and what might be kind of widely recognized as American civil religion, you know, not to say that I think all that is great or anything, but right now there's a lot of people who want to negate all of that stuff. Um, and how do we read that mood of negation alongside the question of hope and political hope? And how would, you know, for those of us who find that mood troubling, um, how do we posit something less troubling? Or is this the vulnerability that sort of you have to perform these exercises and you don't know what's going to happen? Um, it, and in that case is, I guess my question in theological terms is what kind of faith is accompanied by this exercise of hope? Um, that might be all that I should say on that, but I did think that this might be a place to bring back in Dionysius's ecclesial and celestial hierarchies and really think about what does it mean that these like, you know, really material institutional formations exist alongside the exercise of negation. So that's what I've got. Thank you. Thank you so much, Michelle. And um, now we'll have our final panelist um, before David uh, responds, Andre Willis uh, from Brown University. Yeah, thanks, Sarah. And uh, thanks to all the panelists and uh, folks who are here um, at the session. Um, I've been asked to uh, limit my comments to five minutes, so I'll uh, try to do so. Um, let me just say that uh, David Neuheiser, the hope of his family, hope of his community and the hope of his friends, you know? And he's given us all uh, a very poignant and kind of powerful study here, uh, kind of scholarly meditation on hope. But for me, this is a hope that's made lucid by, by melancholy and love, you know? I feel him um, reaching here through the authors that he, he loves and is committed to, to help describe um, and clarify uh, kind of what it means to be human and to be sad, right? And how to deal with that despair. So, you know, for me, the text kind of links the sacred with the secular, the political with the personal, and it highlights the kind of affirmation that's always present in negation to help us understand like why we go on trying in the face of the impossible, the unpredictable, and the absurd. Um, the book is not a distant kind of intellectual reflection or I don't read it as an academic self-help style thing either. It's relevant for scholarly work in philosophy of religion and theology and vital for psycho-emotional self-understanding personally. And to me, David has gifted the world with an updated and kind of more intellectual version of St. John of the Cross, his dark night of the soul. At the same time, he has provided us with a kind of more emotional, useful set of insights than William Connolly's, you know, Augustinian imperative. My guess is that, you know, this is, both figures are in his intellectual inheritance. Yet in this text, he seems to be working as Connolly is, sort of, through or maybe in the mode of Derrida, right? To give us a brilliant gift that gives and takes away um, always and at the same time. So I think that among other things, this text, Hope in a Secular Age, gives philosophers and religionists in late modernity a kind of productive and nuanced way to consider hope. That is hope as a self-critical, and grounded discipline that faces uncertainty and confronts the unknown. 
Further, I think the text creatively uh, draws a kind of constructive through line from Dionysus to Derrida and thus productively bridges what many think of as a gap between deconstruction and Christian theology. Now, again, I want to go back to the personal and highlight the fact that I see my friend David who almost obsessed and fascinated with Derrida and Dionysus in raising the question, how can I link them, given my own suffering, right? And I, I do my work in a room that has a picture of David and Alda right there. So we can, uh, we can affirm, I think, I mean, that helps me affirm both the aesthetic and material qualities of the suffering, both my own to look to him, his to look to Alda, and Alda's to look back at him. But I'm getting too personal now. Um, so I think that this kind of through line that he draws is not just a kind of empty scholarly thing, but it, uh, it bridges a gap between deconstruction and Christian theology because that's where he lives, in that gap, right? Um, third, I think the text is, is brilliant in how it sheds light on ethical traditions that have evolved from a candid confrontation with life's abyss, right? So he wants to kind of lay out a kind of ethical trajectory, uh, an eth the ethical inheritance, right, um, that comes from those who face the unspeakable and persistently grapple with the unknowable. And I think David wants to highlight the kind of potential political energy, as Michelle said, that emerged from the unpredictability of the possible, right? He wants to think about how we attend to unjust forms of power and bureaucracy, but when we affirm a future that we cannot yet see. And I think at the same time, though, the text eschews the kind of conventional notions of God and traditional forms of Christianity, right? Because he doesn't want to live there. Um, he also holds that they, you know, modes of philosophical reflection that stress humans as rational actors, right? And I, I read him as kind of implicitly challenging human rationality regarding both ends and means and human rationality um, regarding kind of communicative action, right? Well, I found the text to also downplay the real collective trauma that comes from the quest for justice and the recognition of the impossibility of its realization under current political conditions and those on the way. That is, political conditions on the way that still won't allow for the possibility of justice, right? I'll come back to that. I'd love to hear more about it. So I want to make two quick points, ask two quick questions, and I'm done. Point one. I take the creative readings of Derrida and Dionysus and apophatic theology to challenge conventional readings of those figures quite directly. And I think this direct challenge makes this text important. Hopefully it'll make the book seminal for those fields. Yet I am not a scholar in apophaticism or Derrida or Dionysus. So my first point is gonna be directed to the account of hope giving here. Now, I'm anticipating to a certain extent scholarly criticisms of the sort of from the analytic track in philosophy of religion, right? To say that I think it would miss the point to quibble about whether the term hope is the most suitable term to describe the complicated processes by which people remain steadfast in the face of uncertainty. That is, the question here uh, really isn't what is hope, right? He, David is not motivated or interested in giving analytical clarity to concepts and categories. Rather, he wants to do something like find a more effective way for us to think about how the human heart presses forward um, in the face of despair, how struggling people keep moving in the face of insurmountable odds in an age where the conditions for religion have shifted such that many Westerners don't want to refer to this kind of work as religion. So drafting a new kind of mythology of hope, and I'm, I'm mindful that David, uh, I'm mindful as I say mythology of hope, that David may not want that to be a way to describe uh, his project, but I think that's a vital grounds for the kind of political energy that he's after, right? And here I'm kind of relying on the, on the work of uh, Chiara Botticci, who thinks of myth, a political myth, that is, as a process, you see, rather than an object. So as process, right, like in Derrida, 
the political myth is always incomplete. Uh, so using hope as a term that references how people continue to try when there's no evidence that supports their trying, um, how they go on when their efforts are in vain can support personal sustenance and help develop just forms of community, right? When we think of it as political myth, right? All right, point two. Um, David rejects hope as rational. On my read, uh, yet on my read, his self-critical and disciplined practice of hope remains seated thoroughly within the realm of the mind and the sphere of consciousness. That is, the mind in the sphere, uh, uh, the mind is sort of remains the sphere of inquiry for David's uh, interrogations around hope, right? Not community, not the body, right? So, uh, I mean, although for Derrida, we know that the subject is always decentered, right? The question of hope is still a highly interior monologue here that goes on within the theater of the mind. And David, like Derrida, of course, thoughtfully keeps track of social practices, and he fittingly, affirm, he fittingly affirms sort of the, the, um, the irrational and the irrational aspects of human existence. Um, and he also suggests that there's more at stake for Derrida than just grammar, inter intertextuality, and traces. But two indispensable elements for hope are missing for me. But they get left out, I should say. And that is community and agency. So I would say some more historicizing and even personal narrative would nicely ground the argument here um, and sort of elevate it to, uh, I think, a, a whole nother level of clarity. Two questions and I'm done. First, I'm wondering about uh, the account of religion we might take from the text. Because um, the only explicit religionist here is Dionysus from the fifth century, the Christian theology. So in his day, religion is more um, a set of socially beneficial celebrations of the gods than it was, than it is in modern philosophy, a system of beliefs, practices, and rules warranted by abstract thought. So for me, it's difficult to think about the broad range of complicated modern forms of religion, including secular forms, given the presence of its absence in the book. So what is religion? Here is my first question. My second question is, I just want to think about self-destruction in the face of this self-critical, disciplined hope, right? So on the model offered here, it seems that the hopes to destroy fit nicely into this notion of resolute persistence in the face of uncertainty. And it's not that I need your conception of hope to fit every example for it's not my aim to contest, right, the usage of the hope you want. Rather, I'm really thinking about like how you suggest we think about things like self-immolation or fasting unto death or suicide bombers or mass shooters, right? Like this is a kind of uh, uh, resolute um, discipline in the face of uncertainty, but it takes a different ethical track. And I was wondering what you might say about that. Sorry to go on too long, but thanks. Thank you, Andre. And thank you to all uh, four of our panelists for their rich and stimulating questions. Um, we'll give David a chance to respond. Um, briefly, and then we'll open it up to more of a conversational um, discussion. So I'll just remind you also that if you would like to ask a question um, for discussion, you can send that to me in a private message, and um, then I will interject um, once we open up the discussion with some of your questions from the floor. Um, David. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, everybody. Um, I feel quite uh, overwhelmed with gratitude for these reflections. I was reading the book again today for the first time in a while, and I realized that that thing that Derrida talks about, the death of the author, is really true, because it felt like the book isn't mine anymore, in a sense. It's out there in the world, and I found things in it when I was rereading it that I didn't, uh, I didn't know were there. And it's, uh, it's a real pleasure and a joy to hear four people that I really respect and appreciate, uh, think, think through the book and in response to the book and against the book because it helps me to see what's, what's in it and what it can be and what there remains to be thought. So since it's the middle of the night over here, 
um, I <laughs> might be a little bit disjointed, but I'll, I'll try to say a few things in response to these um, really interesting questions. And then um, since the book isn't mine, <laughs> uh, other people can, uh, can enter the conversation. Um, so maybe I'll just go in sequence because that's the easiest way to organize my tired mind. Um, like John said, uh, one of the things my book is doing and is revisiting an old debate. I mean, it's, uh, <laughs> I didn't live through it because I'm young enough to have missed the first wave. Um, but I'm, realized, I, I'm well aware, of course, there was a lot of literature on it. I sort of think all of it missed the point, or most of it missed one of the central points, which is the thing that John highlighted, which is the ethical significance of uh, both Derrida's work throughout his corpus, but also Dionysius, and crucially, the relation between them. Um, and I think that's where I would want to think through the question that John raised about metaphysics. I really had no idea, John, what you would think of this book, because there are lots of reasons that a person might suspect that you really kind of hate it. Um, but when I thought about it more, I realized that um, I feel like the book, I meant the book to be, not, to not take a position on metaphysical questions. So in a way, I think that the type of metaphysics that you're invested in is potentially consistent with the account of hope that I'm developing here. The crucial thing for me, it has to do with the modality in which that metaphysics would be affirmed. So uh, I think you're certainly right, as you said, that Derrida and Dionysius don't share a metaphysics, and the fact that Dionysius has this platonic metaphysics is um, a really big difference, and that's one of the ways in which their historical differences matter a great deal. But I think that the the argument that I try to develop in the book quite patiently is that the the way in which Dionysius and Derrida relate to their metaphysical commitments, because they both have a metaphysics of a kind, uh, is is of the same kind as formally congruent, if not identical. And that has to do with this ethics of hope, this discipline of persistence that I find in, in both of them. So that's the thing that I'm sort of curious, I was curious how you would respond to that, because that modality for me um, is the central thing. Um, to my understanding, uh, you're certainly right that uh, Dionysius doesn't posit a sort of endless critique. Critique, as you say, is a word that's foreign to him. And uh, I think apophasis as a, as, a, as a discursive practice is different from deconstruction in lots of important ways. But I think the, I think the thing that's similar for me about Derrida and Dionysius, I think it's there in the text, is that even though Dionysius doesn't say this negativity that he describes, apophasis is endless, he says the end isn't in our grasp. And that's the crucial thing, I think, because that's, I think, the thing that he and Derrida share. So uh, for Dionysius, as, as John said, the church attempts to express the mystery of the divine. And that Dionysius articulates that in terms of this really rich metaphysics. Um, I think Derrida does something that's formally similar in relation to Marxian politics, for instance. Uh, he thinks that certain, particular, certain uh, traditions of political thought express something about democracy and something about justice that Derrida's really invested in, but he doesn't think that they exhaust them. And I think it's that tension, that, that, that act of affirmation of uh, something that must be, that must be subjected to a continual negativity because it fails to exhaust its object. That's the thing I think that Derrida and Dionysius share, and that's the thing that I think is best, that's the, the practice that I think is best explained in terms of hope. Um, I have things to say about um, Agamben and speculative realism, but I think it relates to some of the other points people made. Marius, um, I think the questions that Marius posed are really penetrating. Um, and I'm quite conscious that I'm not going to do them justice. I, I do want to say that, uh, <laughs> as you say, um, no one else sees hope in Dionysius in the way that I do. And that's awkward in a way, <laughs> but I also think that it, uh, there's an explanation of sort of an easily, easily available historical explanation, which I'm just inventing on the spot. But I think it's plausible to say that our access to Dionysius is in part through a uh, medieval scholastic tradition that emphasizes the metaphysical dimension of Dionysius, which as John pointed to, is certainly there. But 
I am really convinced by my argument that Dionysius uh, emphasizes the modality. Dionysius cares a great deal about the modality in which the metaphysics is affirmed. And uh, I take very seriously his gestures of humility, his anxieties about the, um, the sort of reification of a certain construction of the self that he identifies with idolatry. And so I think that even though the metaphysics is important, there is this ethical side to Dionysius, which the medieval tradition de-emphasizes. And because that's where I think the hope lies, that's where the, the temporalization that you're talking about is for me in uh, Dionysius' account of Christian life as an ethical practice that unfolds over time as a sort of continual progress towards a divine that's inexhaustible. Um, I think it's really there, <laughs> that's just to say. And there might be historical reasons why it hasn't been emphasized for us. Um, you ask why hope, and that's a profound question. And I, in a way, I, I would just like to let Andre answer, because I think Andre knows quite well where it comes from in the context of my biography. Um, and I guess to sort of gesture in that direction, for me, it's really important that Camus represents the hinge of the argument in the third chapter when, I, when I'm trying to unpack constructively my account of hope. I, I think I turn to hope as a central concept because uh, I have a, a melancholy inside of me that makes me really respond to the, uh, the demand for lucidity that Camus makes. And I think it's difficult. I think Camus is right that it's really important. In any case, I think it's one thing that in a context like the one that we're in now, which is very dark and difficult, uh, we need a room for that kind of lucidity. And lots of people think that that lucidity excludes religious faith, might exclude hope entirely. That's what at least some of the time Camus says. And uh, I think that's just a mistake, but I also think it would be unfortunate if it's the case. Uh, I guess this is another way of responding to John's um, a point about the difference between Derrida and Dionysius. One of the reasons I want to hold them together using hope as this bridging concept is that I think any religious community or any political movement ought to make room for people who have a melancholic affect and those who have a sanguine affect. And I think hope is a useful concept in part because I think it incorporates both of those things. It makes room for people who are just kind of sad uh, or people who feel like things are really hard um, and for people who, who have a more, uh, a more sort of positive affect, um, I think hope can uh, provide the, those people a way to acknowledge the kind of difficult lucidity that Camus describes, but work, work together um, in common projects. Uh, you talk about hope as a gift, Marius, and um, I'm, I think I'm going to table that because I think that relates to what I want to say about Andre's comments. Um, but uh, I'm grateful for the gift of that uh, pointed question. And I mean gift with all the derating and ambivalence that you have in mind. Um, so to Michelle's summary, I thought was really, really useful as she said. I mean, I, um, I like very much the summary of what I've said. Uh, I think it's really, really crisp and it makes me think this, might, this book might be okay, which um, along, the, along the way, I wasn't always sure. Um, I, I didn't say much in the book, it's true, about what, what sort of rule of life or what sort of community support um, the discipline of hope would require. And it's something that I've been thinking about a lot since then. So I guess it's the, in the wake of the movement for black lives, in the wake of uh, um, uh, the uh, sort of COVID disaster that we're all living through. I've been, I've been, <laughs> Uh, realizing that one of the things my book doesn't do, which isn't necessarily a deficiency of the book, but it's an open question, as you said, uh, is what, what material conditions do people need to hope in the way that I've described it? So the way that I describe hope is intended, I think, to describe a human capacity that I think is really important. I think it's important in response to critiques of Christianity. I think I want to say that people have the capacity to do things that seem crazy to people with a certain rational cast of mind that uh, I emphasize the importance of will with, re with respect to hope, because I would say to people that, uh, that their hope doesn't need to be limited by what seems possible. 
uh, that people actually can um, can do things uh, that are uh, excessive and inordinate and um, beautiful and dangerous. Uh, and yeah, so I'm committed to that as a possibility, but uh, partly because lockdown has been hard for a lot of people, including me, but even harder on a lot of other people. Um, and uh, as always, the burdens of this crisis are distributed unequally. I've been conscious that there are certain kinds of uh, safety and, and care and support that hope requires to thrive. And uh, that's the sort of thing that I'm thinking through in relation to my next book. So it's just to say, I don't think I have a great answer, but it's also the question that I have at the front of my mind. The thing in my life, which Andre alluded to, uh, that I found is that uh, there have been times when I felt like I, did, I, I didn't have access to this capacity that I believe in. I know that it's in principle something humans can do, but there have been times in my life when I've just been broken down and I didn't see a way forward, really. I mean, I've experienced despair for a really deep kind. And in that context, I've required, I've, I've relied on the, on the grace of friends. I mean, this is to go back to Marius's allusion to the gift. Um, I feel like my own hope isn't entirely my doing. It comes from beyond myself. And uh, in a theological mode, I would describe that in, re in relation to um, the, the divine, but I can also uh, <laughs> trace the gift of grace through people who have loved me and sustained me really well. And I know that um, I couldn't hope without them. And I believe that's true of other people too, which is just another way to say, I wanna think more about that question. I think this question that, that Michelle asks about what a negative political the theological aesthetic would look like is, is just a really, really brilliant question. I mean, I feel like it's like a lightning bolt and I just love this question. And it's not one I've thought about, but uh, I have an answer that's, that's at my fingertips because yesterday, Alda and I uh, were watching clips from the Democratic National Convention. And like a lot of people, I'm kind of cynical about party politics. I've never felt particularly identified with a political party. And I kind of feel like the mechanics of a convention are generally pretty hokey and lame. But I had heard that the roll call uh, was, uh, was a, uh, a powerful moment, and so I wanted to watch it. And this is a, this is a moment, uh, for those who haven't watched it, where each state uh, traditionally would, its representatives would cast their nominating votes uh, for, in this case, one of two candidates, or both candidates, Bernie Sanders and, and Joe Biden. And usually it's a sort of pro forma process in the convention hall, it's kind of boring. But this time, because everyone's at home, each state did it live from that state, and they had normal people, in many cases, talking about their state, and for 30 seconds, um, saying something before fulfilling the political process. And it, it drove me to tears. I didn't expect it, but I was, throughout the 45-minute video, <laughs> I was just weeping, um, kind of uncontrollably. And I think it's, there are a lot of reasons, and I could say a lot about it, but I think it's partly because of this aesthetic that, that Michelle was asking about, because there was something beautifully pluralistic about it, not just the sort of things that people say about the Democratic Party and how it's diverse and how there are you know, people speaking in various languages, looking in various ways, um, various genders represented. All of that is, is true and it's important. But just the fact that there were lots and lots of people who were saying things that really mattered to them. And I kind of feel like that's what I would want the aesthetic of negative political theology to look like. So John uh, suggested that Derrida is a sort of unreconstructed conventional liberal. That may or may not be true about Derrida's own politics. I, I don't share his enthusiasm for the UN Security Council, for instance. But the, the, I think maybe the best reader of Derrida, actually, um, present company accepted, would be Chantal Mouffe, whose politics of agonistic democratic theory uh, I think is a really beautiful expression of what I think is most important about Derrida. And there's something about a vision of democracy that's radically inclusive that I found in that somewhat hokey but actually deeply beautiful video from the DNC. And it's that sort of pluralism that I think is important about a negative political theology, which opens a space in my understanding for a kind of affirmation that flows, it moves, it allows for uh, multiple voices to be included. It doesn't foreclose affirmation, but the negativity that's built into it 
uh, is uh, it, it inspires, in my understanding, a sort of forward outpouring of affirmation, plurality of affirmation. Now I'm rambling, so um, I think I'll leave Michelle's question about Cora, even though it's really great, and talk about Andre's comments. I mean, I feel like Andre's reflections on the book uh, I found quite moving because uh, Andre knows where it comes from in the context of my life. And um, I'm glad that he found its personal meaning for me there. Um, and I think I want to say in response to his questions. Um, so first, what account of religion is here? I, I mean, one of the things that's that's sort of in the background of the book, that, but I think it's important is that I want to distance my argument from religion as a category to some extent. So when religion does come in, I try to pluralize it and historicize it. And in a way, I think I'm following Derrida here. So I have a, a translation of a piece that Derrida uh, wrote on secularization that'll come out in a couple of months. One of the things that's there, especially explicitly, is also implicit in his earlier work is that Derrida realizes, unlike a lot of other continental theorists, that religion is a category with a history and so is secularization. So in a way, Derrida's skeptical of this kind of univocal ideology of secularization. He, I think, is a kind of Milbank avant la lettre, uh, let's say. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I don't want to give a generalized account of, of religion or even Christianity. That's one of the reasons why the book is so specific in relation to Dionysius. Uh, I, I also want to say, I mean, there's a lot I want to say about what Andre said about hope as a process. Um, but one thing I want to highlight, because it's on my mind today, because uh, just uh, just a few minutes before I logged on here, I saw that uh, another black man was killed in Wisconsin, uh, Jacob Blake, shot by police while trying to get in his car. And we don't really know what happened there, uh, but it's another heartbreaking event. And I feel like I'm trying to learn from what events like this and the, the really powerful political response to them, uh, what they have to teach me about hope. And I don't think I have an answer to that. But that's what I think of when, Andre, you talk about how uh, I, I want to think about um, the relationship between collective trauma and political hope. So in my own life, on a personal level, as I've said, hoping through melancholy and trauma is really important. But I also think there's something collectively, both in response to the um, systemic racism in the US and elsewhere, uh, and the broken bodies leave behind, but also um, in relation to COVID that, that all of us in a way, in different ways are experiencing. And uh, yeah, I guess that's just to say, I hope that my account of hope speaks to that. I think it does, but it's something I feel challenged to think more about. So thanks to you for pressing me in that direction. And I'm sorry we've gone, so, gone on so long, but I um, want to hear what others have to say now. Wonderful. Thank you, David. Um, since we only have about 20 minutes to go, I have a collection of questions. Um, and maybe in the interests of time, um, I'll just present them together and then um, let David pick up on them um, as he sees fit. Um, so the first question from is from Alan F. Weaver, um, who's asking how you would describe the difference between the resilience promoted by corporal managers of a neoliberal order and the disciplined resilience of a hope emerging from the negative theology you advance. Um, and then I have um, a couple of questions from um, Richard Swinney. Um, and both of these are sort of questions on points of precision about defining hope and, and they, that I think are um, work well as a pair. So is hope a discipline? Can one discipline oneself to hope without hope degrading into an empty platitude? And is hope an ethical concept? His suspicion is that it is not. Um, and I will, then we have another question about um, institutional loci of hope. And this is from Ryan Hacker, Hacker. Um, 
which is in response to the apparent divergence of the metaphysics of the pseudo Dionysius and Derrida, David has emphasized their formally congruent modality of the open finality of hope. If, as David seems to suggest, this hope perpetually exceeds any positive institution of political theology, it seems to escape any mediating institution, whether church, state, or family. How then can we hold to a hope that could enter into social relations that give structure and purpose to our lives? Um, and I'll just start there and um, let David respond. And then if we get some other questions, um, we'll do this again. Um, and if people also want to um, interject into in a more conversational mode, um, I think David uh, would welcome that as well. So um, I'll try to both get to as many questions as possible and also open it up a little more. Yeah, thanks. So I'll, I'll, I'll take that as an inducement to be crisper than it was the first time, um, because I'd be interested to know uh, what our panelists think about all of this too. But um, so briefly, hi, hi, Ep, nice to see you. Um, I think the problem with neoliberalism is one that's much on my mind. Um, I've worked through it mainly so far in relation to Foucault, so it's not in this book, but it's what my next book is about quite centrally in a way. Uh, so I'm working on a book now on a political theology of miracles. And one of the reasons that I think miracles are productive uh, as a political concept, I mean, I think they're already there in our politics descriptively, but normatively I think they're useful in part because I think one of the things that neoliberalism does, especially in its uh, sort of theoretical economized version is to uh, insist upon the calculability of human behavior. And I think the sort of neoliberal disciplines that you're asking about uh, do that. It's about managing people in particular directions. Uh, I am interested in miracles as a sort of cousin concept to hope, partly because I think they have an eruptive character that uh, is a way to short circuit or show the limits of that kind of, uh, let's say, te teleological calculability. Uh, of individual behavior. My understanding of hope as a discipline is something like the Foucauldian care of itself, which I understand is a, um, as a discipline that one takes on for oneself. Um, and yeah, rather than it being prescribed for one, I could say more, but maybe I'll leave it there. So Richard's question, um, also in relation to hope as a discipline, I think uh, for me, one of the things that's important about conceiving hope as a discipline is, I think first saying that it's more than just a desire or a feeling, because I my instinct is that I at least want to hope to do more work than that would allow. And also to say that it's not restricted by rational calculation, because for me, it's important to say that I hope for the impossible, uh, that hope can have an object that one takes to be impossible, because I think that's an important human capacity. And I think the language of discipline and the centrality of the will um, captures that. It also captures something that's important in the traditional discussion insofar as for Thomas Aquinas, for instance, the object of hope is an arduous good, which is difficult to obtain. So I think hope as a discipline for me is meant to echo that. And that's precisely what's meant to keep it from degrading into a platitude, which is to say hope is hard and it's not always, uh, it's not always the right thing to do, which is the sense in which I would say hope isn't ethical, is not ethical in my understanding in the sense that it's always good. I'm reluctant to say that hope is a virtue. I do think it's ethical insofar as it involves the kind of uh, Foucauldian ethics that I gestured to in relation to, to Alan, uh, which is to say it's a, it's a disciplined practice, um, uh, a work of ascesis. Um, to Ryan, I would have to think more, and we should talk more about hope and mediation. Uh, I think in a way, my, my comments in response to Michelle and Andre and Marius gesture at the importance of institutions, and it's something that I think I need to think more about. Uh, in a way, it's not what this book is about, but I realized that part of the story will have to be about the material and communal conditions for hope. Um, I guess I want to say uh, one of the things that's important about my account of hope is that I want it to be maximally hospitable in a sense. So um, I would have lots, lots to say, I think, about the theology and the politics that I uh, think sh should, should be the object of one's hope or that is, in fact, the object of my hope. But I, I don't, I want my hope to be open, my, my account of hope to be accessible to people who have a, a wide range of commitments. And, and in fact, I think it is. 
So one of the reasons I don't, in this book, talk about the sort of institutional mediation that you have in mind is that I want people to see that it, hope can be mediated by a number of different institutions. I think people can do that work to some extent. Um, but I do recognize this work that needs to be done. Travis, go ahead and ask your question. Thank you. Uh, hi, David. Um, I have a question which might be a bit um, uh, naughty, but uh, you said at one point that any political movement must make room for people who have a melancholic affect. Now, I know what you mean, of course, but I do wonder if this is something that um, at least I'm unwilling to accept. It seems if we define or if we can understand melancholy, at least in part, as a tendency towards indecision um, for a number of reasons, this is the one thing that political movements can't uh, tolerate, at least with regards to the ends of the movement or the program in question. Um, I understand, of course, the need to build a politics, which is large enough and hospitable enough to um, make room for a number of affects and experiences, of course, and all that. But in terms of concrete political action, um, and even perhaps the aesthetics that we were talking about before, um, you know, then I wonder if we're not uh, poisoning the well before we get off the blocks. Now, I know this is like, kind of taking a broader point and maybe running with it in a direction that you're not trying to go, but I do wonder if you can maybe address this idea that political action is something um, that actually requires a certain kind of affective matrix, which is not best described uh, as melancholic and which might have reasons to exclude um, uh, uh, that kind of approach. Yeah, thanks, Travis. Um, I mean, I think the simplest thing to say is that when I, when I said melancholy, I, I thought of, was thinking of something different, uh, which is not something that uh, that is ex excluding decision, I think. Um, but maybe there's something proximate to what you're saying that I had in mind, which is that I suppose in my melancholy moments, uh, in the moments that I think of as melancholy, I can find decisions especially difficult to make. I know that the, there's a sort of gravity of, uh, of despair, which I've sometimes felt. Um, and this is a common description of depression. But I think that what I mean is that uh, political movements ought to be able to incorporate both people who find uh, decisions easily available and those that find them difficult. Because one of the things I think is useful about Derrida is that he, in my understanding, one of the central things that he's doing is articulating the, the ways in which decisions are difficult. They're not given. He thinks people need to take responsibility for them and feel a weight of them. And that's one of the things I think a melancholic affect can, can teach, at least in the way that I think about it. That decision doesn't have to necessarily be um, an easy thing, but it's possible, it's possible to take a decision, even if one doesn't feel the momentum of decision within oneself. That makes sense. I guess another way to say, maybe <laughs> I can see you frowning. Maybe, maybe, the, maybe better words are the ones that, uh, that uh, Andre was, was using, uh, so he was talking about um, collective trauma. So I guess, to maybe to use words that you'd be happier with, I want to say that people who feel the force of trauma ought to have a place um, alongside people who aren't attuned to that in the same way in any church worth the name or any movement for justice worth the name. Um, I have a question from Amy. Uh, Amy, would you like to ask your question? Um, sure, I can if you like. Right. Hi, Hi, you can hear me. Hey, David, good to see yeah. you again. Um, uh, yeah, I was wondering um, how small and uncertain ethics can really be and, you know, keep that name. Uh, sort of ventriloquize someone I know you have numerous disagreements with. Um, yeah, I can expand on that if you want, or you can just <laughs> give me two more sentences, Amy. Okay. Um, it seems to me that like a hope for the impossible or, um, you know, a, a hope as uncertain as the hope that you talk about, um, would risk kind of, or, or wouldn't be capable of being turned into something like an ethics. Um, because which would offer us some kind of, or at least a little bit more certainty 
a little bit more kind of programmatic than um, I think a hope for the impossible can offer us. Yeah, yeah, okay, I think I think I get what you're getting at. And I definitely feel the force of that question because I, I'm allergic to a certain kind of ethics, maybe the, the ethics that's best at marketing itself. Um, yeah. Uh, and yeah, there's a kind of moralism about that that I, I certainly don't feel drawn to. And Derrida, as you were saying, is uh, definitely distant from. But I do think that there, maybe I want to reclaim the term uh, ethics along with Foucault and I think Derrida um, as uh, taking on responsibility, as an act of taking on responsibility. That's not, uh, it's not uh, given in a way that absolves one of responsibility. There's a kind of uh, struggle and uncertainty to it, but it's also unavoidable in Derrida's sense. We have the responsibility to act as best we can, even though we know that we can't fulfill it. Um, so, so yeah, I guess I think if with Levinas, Derrida, and Foucault, we can reclaim the term ethics, uh, I think it fits. And I think maybe it's a good thing for the world if we did that. Excellent. Um, so we have another question from Toshiro Osawa. Um, Toshiro, again, if you'd like to ask your question, um, yourself by activating the microphone. You're free okay. to do that. All right. Okay, thank you. Um, my question relates to what Michelle mentioned, three questions of philosophy for Kant. What can I know and what ought I to, I to do and what may I hope? And uh, in the critique of pure reason where he mentioned that three questions a few paragraphs later, he in my interpretation, he says what the question of what may happen bridges the question of what ought to happen and the question of what does happen. So I'd like to hear your take on what you mean by modality in relation to the difference among may, ought to, and does in relation to hope. Wow, if I had known there was going to be a Kantian here, I would have I would have chosen my words more carefully. No, I'm kidding. I, I didn't know you were going to be here. Could you say a bit more, Toshiro, about uh, what's at stake for you in the question about modality? So, so in 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 hope, he says what ought to happen leads to what does actually happen, and he Kant has in my mind is the highest good in which happiness is accorded to virtue proportionally. And the object of hope here is happiness accorded to virtue. And it, it ought to happen, but in the hope, it becomes what does actually happen. Right, right. No, I, okay, of course, I remember now. Um, yeah, I mean, I love, I love Kant a lot. Uh, but uh, alluding to John's earlier gesture at uh, Kantian critiques of metaphysics, I think I, Derrida and I love Kant mainly for his uh, political and ethical writing, so that side of his work rather than the concern with metaphysics. Um, it's something that I, I want to write about at some point because I think Religion Within the Limits is a, an amazing book. Mm -hmm. um, I think that I don't have an answer at my fingertips because I haven't written on this yet. But my instinct would be to say that on, on the sort of quasi-Deridian account of hope that I've given, Derrida's difference would be to say that uh, Kant's claim that what ought to happen leads to what does happen uh, might insist too much on, a, on the particularity of an ideal, which Derrida would want to set in motion by rendering it quasi-transcendental. So uh, I guess that's to say again that um, I find Derrida's vision of Kant's vision of cosmopolitanism is the thing that I think Derrida draws his hope from less, less than the side of Kant's account of hope that you were gesturing at. But I feel like to really understand this, I'll need to read your book. So I, I look forward to doing it when it's, it's ready. Thank you. 
Um, we have five minutes. So if there is maybe one more question for David or, um, yes, Dennis. I was uncertain about the mechanics of intervening, so I've kind of held back. But um, <clears throat> thanks for the invitation. Uh, uh, David, you connect, I think, very much part of your book and your argument, you connect hope with will. This is quite untraditional. Um, the tradition connecting hope with memory uh, and therefore with the construction of narratives of connecting past, present and future intimately within this primal act of memory, which interestingly, of course, Augustine gives such priority to that he identifies memory with the father, the, the Trinitarian father, the source, the ground and so on. And I wonder, this is a very general point, probably impossible to answer, but I just wanted to raise it with you, is that, is that I, I detect a strongly affirmed voluntarism in your approach that places will at the center. And, <clears throat> and uh, I think this affects pretty much every single answer you've given to every question this evening. I just pointed out to you, uh, not to kind of terrorize you with the thought that you're doing something which you oughtn't to be doing, but just to, to, to as it were, identify precisely what seems to govern the sets of inferences which you connected in, uh, in your exposition and in your book and in your answers. I don't know whether you have any thoughts on that. Yeah, I should have prepared a thought because you, <laughs> you've made this complaint before, um, or rather you've made this observation before. I, I think the main thing I want to say is that uh, I, I would like to think through the relationship between my account of hope and medieval debates over voluntarism more thoroughly, but I'm pretty sure that I want my account of hope not to be uh, voluntaristic in a sort of totalizing metaphysical way, but just to say that I think that uh, rationality and affect, I think, have a certain role to play in that. But I think emphasizing the element of the will helps to clarify certain features which are in, important as such, but also especially now to understanding how, how hope works. Um, so that's just to say, uh, I don't want to be voluntaristic in general, but I do think that there's something important about the will in relation to hope. I also think just to... Um, demonstrate my ecumenical credentials that there's also something really important about memory. So I think this, your point about memory relates to the points that Michelle and uh, Marius and others were raising about my account, which is to say that uh, where, where a person comes from and the, the sort of time that they carry within them uh, shapes their, their hopes in really profound ways. And um, that's something because my, my, book on hope is meant to to do one particular thing in relation to hope and certain problems that arise it's not um, it's not a sort of um, thoroughgoing phenomenology of hope in all its aspects but such a phenomenology would have to take memory into account to be sure okay excellent well david um Maybe I'll just leave it to you to say some, to, in case you have some concluding words um, as we bring this discussion to a close. Yeah, I just want to say thank you to everyone. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm sad that it's over because I, um, I want to know what everyone else thinks about all of these important topics that we've been talking about. Um, I'm really grateful to all of you for coming, um, especially my brothers and sisters uh, in Oceana, um, Amy and I see Gordon is here and Peter and others. Thanks for staying up um, after midnight. Uh, and yeah, to all the rest of you, it's quite generous. Um, and to the panelists especially, I mean, I, I think these questions I find um, moving both intellectually and effectively. And uh, mostly now I'm, I'm grateful for the conversation, but. Also really sad that I can't take everyone for a drink because that would be really fun, but next year in Jerusalem. Well, thank you again to everyone so much. Um, thanks to David for your responses, um, the panelists and to everybody who came and asked their, asked their great questions.